Hi everyone, welcome to week 6. We've already seen how logical and tautological consequence works, and we're going to move on to methods of proof. The basic idea is that although truth tables provide us a really nice tool for showing that a uh, consequence follows tautologically from a set of premises, they can get really elaborate really quick. Here's an example of what I mean. Suppose we want to assess an argument that has premises and a conclusion that incorporate in all 10 atomic subformulas. That's not crazy big, but the truth table will be. Recall that the number of rows that go into a truth table are 2 to the power of n, where n is the number of atomic subformulas. So if we want to construct a truth table to assess whether this argument is valid, we're going to need 1,024 rows. Um, that's way too big. Um, U of T would never allow an assessment of that size, and I don't even know if I own enough pencils myself to construct one. Fortunately, there's a more concise method of showing that a conclusion follows from a set of premises, and that's to construct a proof for it. In a proof, we proceed by a series of valid inference steps from premises to conclusion. We're going to see how this works in just a minute. We're going to start by looking at what a valid inference rule is, in theory, and then look at the rules for conjunction. So, in some respects, a proof is kind of like a special sort of list, and it's a list in which each of the sentences we introduce depends on prior ones, either prior sentences that we've proved or the premises. Now, we'll be proving this formally later on using the Fitch system, which has a Fitch bar like this, and a list of premises over top of the horizontal bar. From these, we can derive further conclusions, Q1 through Qn. At each step, we appeal to a rule of some sort. We'll see in greater detail how this works. The main point of this week's lectures is to introduce informally the idea behind some of these formal rules that we'll be developing next week. Now, as we've seen, there are two ways of introducing a sentence. Either it has to depend on a prior sentence, either in the proof or in the set of premises, or it has to be a logical truth. So we've seen, for instance, that at any point you can always state A equals A, because that's just a logical truth. Let's zero in on these rules. The first of these deals with the operator AND. Suppose in the course of a proof we show Q1 and later on Q2. This could be in the course of an informal proof or a formal proof. These sentences could be anything, say, cube A, or A is between B and C. Once we get these, we're allowed to put them together into a conjunction. This is pretty basic and it almost goes without saying, but it's worth thinking about for a minute. The point is that we're allowed to make a conjunction of any two sentences we like, as long as they're higher up in our list because everything in the list depends on either logical truths or premises we've taken for granted. So from A is a cube and A is between B and C, we can derive A is a cube and A is between B and C. This rule is called conjunction introduction. The second rule for AND is conjunction elimination, which just tells us that if we have two sentences conjoined like this, Q1 and Q2, we're allowed to derive from them either one of the conjuncts, either Q1 or Q2. Again, I think this is pretty straightforward. If I say we're having a picnic and I'm bringing drinks, you're free to derive from this both we're having a picnic and I'm bringing drinks. So this might seem like a lot of fuss over something that's quite straightforward, but this is one of our rules and the rationale for it makes good sense. Again, this is the rule of conjunction elimination. Next up is one of the rules for OR, which is sometimes called addition or disjunction introduction. And this is that if we have a sentence, say Q1, which we've proved in the course of our proof, we're allowed to derive from this Q1 or Q2. Now this rule strikes some people as odd, and there's good reason for that. If you give me a sentence, Q1, say we're going on a picnic, and I add to it, we're going on a picnic or we're going to the movies, it seems like I'm basically throwing information away. I'm taking one statement that actually tells you something and turning it into a disjunction that doesn't assert either of its parts. So this strikes some people as really weird. I only say this because if you think it's odd, you're not alone. But suppose I wanted you to prove A and B or C. And at some point in your proof you got A, at some other point in your proof you got B, then by disjunction introduction you're allowed to give me B or C, and then by conjunction introduction you're allowed to add this together with A on the line above. So although it seems like you're throwing information away, 
we don't want to limit ourselves in terms of what operations we can have because at some point you might want to prove a disjunction as part of a larger formula or for whatever other reason. And this is just the way that OR works. You can always introduce as many other sentences as you like in a disjunctive string with one you've already proved. And these are just the basic rules for conjunction introduction, conjunction elimination, and disjunction introduction, which itself is sometimes called addition. Later on, we'll see these formal rules in action. And in the next video, we're going to have a look at some rules that are a little less obvious.